Alright folks, Crontendo is back, and today we are going to go through the entire month of September 1987, only three months before we hit 1988. Big news in September is the emergence of Atlas as a developer to watch, and the release of a fantastically different game from Culture Brain, and a huge chunk of bonus content this time around as we take a look at computer games, or at least western computer games, in 1987. But first up, let's finish up August. 1987. Now you might not have known it, but Crontendo episode 21 was a cliffhanger episode. We left off with Transformers the Headmasters from Takara, and you were doubtlessly wondering what sort of amazing stuff will Takara come up with next. Well, the wait is over, because Takara released two games that same day, so we pick up on August 28th with Photon, the ultimate game on planet Earth. Yes, Photon is the ultimate game on planet Earth, it says so right in the subtitle, so you know this has got to be good. I mean, you can't lie in a video game title now, can you? So, wow, we've got these crazy 3D graphics. Your character is trapped in this underground maze under constant attack from these little aliens that whiz by your head. And you need to collect items. Not cool items, mind you. No ice ray here, folks. No, you need items like the loader, the counter, the marker, and discs. Wow, that's kind of lame. And for some reason, the aliens all make these completely inappropriate, like, vintage arcade game sound effects. Now, there actually is one cool item, the yellow stone. This allows you to move up and down the vertical passageways that connect the game's seven or so levels. And by the way, the discs that you collect simply have little hints in them. Now, admittedly, the uh, attempt to make 3D maze games uh, sometimes falls a bit short of the mark, and that's certainly true here. Um, it uses backgrounds drawn using perspective, but uh, as you move forward, the static background is simply replaced by a black screen for a second, and then the next background appears. There's no attempt to make it appear as if the walls were actually moving, and your sprite remains the same size as you walk into the background though the enemy sprites do get bigger as they approach. Combat can sometimes be obnoxiously tough with certain enemies. You can only fire straight ahead, so not much aiming is really possible. And the hit detection is sometimes kind of weird. Enemies can touch you and do damage, even though they are supposed to be at the other end of the hall. Though, despite all this, Photon is, you know, the ultimate game on planet Earth, which makes pretty much every game released after this one completely redundant, so I guess there's really no point in continuing the series any further. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Okay, not really, I guess. We'll keep going for just a little while, just to see if anything else interesting pops up. I suppose everything will seem a bit anticlimactic after Photon, the ultimate game on planet Earth, but maybe we'll come across something interesting eventually. Well, it's time for yet another Family Trainer game. This time around, we have Family Trainer Manhattan Police. By now, we find that Bandai has moved away from the sports and exercise theme titles and is now focusing more on action games. Here you play one of New York City's finest out to rid the streets of crime. Nintendo had been releasing uh, some of the Power Pad games themselves in the US, but for this one, they decided not to touch it, leaving Bandai to put it out themselves. In the US, they released it under the name of Street Cop. I guess the red and green color scheme seemed a little garish, though they changed it to sort of like a uh, boring back alley background here. Incidentally, this was the last of Bandai's Family Trainer games to be released in the US, having come out oh, around mid-1989. But it certainly was not the last Family Trainer game in Japan. Now the plot is quite simple, you need to bust a series of criminals that range from pickpockets to mob bosses. Each one has their own level. You need to take on a series of henchmen and underlings before the boss himself appears. Much like the last Family Trainer game, which we saw like two episodes ago, this involves somewhat more complicated controls. You not only have to run on the power pad, but you need to move your character vertically, that is, up and down, make 90 degree turns to go around corners, 
and make a 180 degree turn to reverse direction. You can also use items and swing your nightstick. In Street Cop, law enforcement primarily consists of running up to suspicious looking individuals and beating them into submission. You can also throw a Coke can at them. Well, I'm not really sure if this follows normal New York City police policies. Also in Central Park, that last episode there, uh, muggers tend to hide in those red things, which I assume are wastebaskets. If so, they're inconveniently tall. The levels do get more complex as the game progresses. The second level takes place in a severely run-down Harlem, parts of which were actually in pretty bad shape in the 1980s. Oh yes, and also make sure you don't fall down any manholes. Like the other Human Develop Family Trainer games, Street Cop is pretty well done, assuming of course that you don't have any issues with the rather uh, gimmickiness of the controls. We kick off September 1987 with a bang. A huge bang, with this extremely creative and unusual game from Culture Brain, Arabian Dream Scheherazade. On the title screen, note the name Micro Academy. This was some sort of internal development company whose name appears on a few Culture Brain games. You might recall Culture Brain from earlier Famicom titles, Super Chinese and Hear You No know Kin, aka Flying Dragon The Secret Scroll. Both were not very good, but uh, sort of original. Arabian Dream ups the ante considerably. In brief, it's a Zelda-like RPG, but goes far beyond any other similar games up to this point. Now, for you old-school NES fans, this is a game you know as Magic of Scheherazade. Culture Brain, unlike many small Japanese video game companies, had a US division, and the game was reworked, uh, given a very good translation, and released in the US in 1989. First off, the music has been improved quite a bit. Now the plot involves an amnesiac, time-traveling wizard, whose girlfriend was kidnapped by an evil wizard named Sabaron. At the start, you choose one of three classes. Magician, fighter, or saint. Standard RPG stuff, but not normally seen in Japanese RPGs at this time. You can even change classes throughout the game, and in fact, you'll probably have to. Now the beginning plops you down in the typical RPG town, with a shop, a motel, and various NPCs to offer up suggestions as to what to do next. However, you'll note some features not found in other Famicom games. For example, when you go into the shop, you can actually attempt to bargain with the shopkeeper at your risk. Though of course, if he doesn't like you, He'll actually charge you a bit of money and kick you out without your items. You can even take out loans, which you'll need to pay back later. Now as you've probably noticed comparing this to the footage we saw just a second ago of the Japanese version, there have been some changes made uh, with the character sprites. For example, the googly-eyed main character looks a bit different, and there have been sort of subtle changes made to all the NPCs. However, the shopkeepers and the various character portraits of those NPCs found inside buildings remain the same. Now once out on the overworld, you'll clearly see the barely concealed similarity to Zelda. But Scheherazade is not content to merely be a Zelda clone. Now you do find various hidden doors on the overworld. You uncover them by using, in the US version, your spell Oprin, in the Japanese version to buy items to open doors. But we also have time travel. Each level has a hidden door that allows you to go into the future or the past as needed. In this case, uh, the city you need to go to flooded years ago, so you travel back into time 50 years and find the city before it flooded. Each level is similar, but with uh, various differences at different points in time, and you can actually use this to your advantage. For example, you can plant a rupia tree seed in the past in the magic field. I just found the entrance to the magic field here. It takes years to grow, but if we return to the same spot in the future, you'll find the tree fully grown and you'll be able to harvest tons of money off the tree. Yeah, I know, a tree that grows money, that seems pretty strange. But there are a lot of weird trees in this game. Oh yes, there are also uh, solar eclipses, which provide various advantages. That's for example when you can plant the rupia seed, or you can use the great magic spells, which are major magical spells that can be used only once. 
Another unusual feature, there are universities from which you can learn the great spells, as well as different battle formations. Also, universities will provide you with a weapons upgrade after taking certain courses. These formations, seen here, are helpful when you fight certain groups of enemies, and allow you to combine your uh, character's magic to perform special attacks. Yep. So we have time travel and the special attacks. Those make Shehrazad seem like an early ancestor to Chrono Trigger. Now while we've seen Famicom games imitate Zelda and Dragon Quest, Shehrazad is basically the first to take everything from both games, mash them all together, and then add a bunch of other stuff as well. It's both an action RPG and a turn-based RPG. You fight Zelda-style overworld battles and random turn-based battles. These battles resemble Dragon Quest II style battles, but are a bit more involved. There's more spells, and they include various sorts of status spells and combo spells. Additionally, each level contains underground mazes, seen here. These kind of resemble those of Dragon Quest. Whereas there's also various castles that are more like Zelda's dungeon. Each level ends with a boss battle. Choosing the Magician class will make the boss battle seem a lot easier because you're of your uh, ranged weapon. The rod is much more powerful when you're a magician. So what are you actually doing in the mazes? Well, often uh, you're looking for other playable characters to join your party. Here, for example, I'm looking for this flying monkey who is required to navigate a desert. How many characters are there? Well, aside from the main character, 11. Compare that to Dragon Quest 2. It's like playing Romancing Saga or something like that. Now, the game has a often very quirky sense of humor. For example, he visited this city in the past before it flooded, one old guy said he was never going to budge from his spot. If you visit it in the present, post-flood, he's still there, living underwater. And your characters are all quite kooky. Genies, a robot named Gunmech, a living doll made out of a pumpkin, a greedy guy named Mustafa, a shrimp named Rainy. The personalities are reasonably well-defined, as seen in these cutscenes here. They're actually quite charming. All this crazy stuff in the game, but you know, there's actually more. You can find hidden shops to hire troopers to assist you in the turn-based battles. These guys fight in groups of four, and this is actually mostly what you need the money from the Rupia Tree for. These guys get stronger and stronger as the game progresses and can do serious damage, not to mention soak up a lot of uh, damage meant for the party. As in all Japanese RPGs of this era, you can't choose specifically which enemy to hit, so your characters sort of hit enemies at random. I'll note that on these turn-based battle sequences, all of the enemies have been completely redesigned for the US version. I think in the Japanese version, they tend to look a little weirder, where in the US version, they sort of look a little bit more comic booky. Out of your party, you can choose up to three characters for each battle. They all have, sort of have their different strengths and weaknesses. Some are strong physically, whereas others have powerful magic attacks, and others are kind of useless. Some of the special formation spells are actually quite insane. Money Burn, for example. It will transform the enemies into rockets, which will then fly up and blow themselves up, causing instant death. Now this is completely hardcore. And some of the enemies are a little bit weird, and one boss, this one, is actually very badly translated as Curly. Stupid name, you think, until you see the boss and realize she's supposed to be Kali. As we'll see in another game this episode, Japanese game designers seem quite fond of throwing in gods from other cultures. The bosses all tend to have two forms, some sort of special spell act activities required to bring out the second form. In Hindu iconography, Kali is sometimes depicted as a peaceful goddess, and sometimes as a battle-frenzied and much scarier goddess, and often she has four arms. Hmm, four arms? Well, so much for accuracy here. Another very cool-looking boss is this guy, Salamander. Now, why is a gigantic fire monster called Salamander? We'll actually discuss that in another game later this episode. And while the action-based combat can sometimes be troublesome, the boss battles can be either too simplistic or just plain infuriating. Salamander rises up for a few seconds, you shoot at him, he'll then hide behind his fire field, you'll need Rainy to cast a spell to bring him back out again, and then repeat. However, if Rainy runs out of magic points before he defeats Salamander, then you're pretty much SOL. The thing is, you do have magic refill items, thing that looks like a glass in the lower right hand corner. I had five of them while fighting Salamander, but the thing is, they can only be used automatically when you run out of magic. You can't use them manually, and for some reason, Rainy will never use one to replenish his magic in this sequence. 
Now, sometimes really horrible special enemies will appear on the overworld. This Barzil Magician, for example. He'll cast Moonburn on you, which can instantly kill you by turning into a rocket. Trust me, these sequences will cause you to throw your controller in anger over and over again. They're like the eggplant magicians in Kid Icarus, but much, much worse. Now, once you actually find Cerebon, turns out you don't fight him. Nope, you talk to him, and it is revealed that he's unleashed a evil force more powerful than himself. And there's actually a little plot twist that I certainly had no idea that was coming. Now, another rather bad decision in this game is that just like uh, Dragon Quest, he asks you some kind of question, and if you answer it incorrectly, you fail the game. The answer to this question really isn't that difficult, but, you know, it is a bit of a pain if you somehow get the answer wrong. It's an instant game over. And then the final boss is also a bit of a pain, due to the fact that when he appears, you need to actually sort of stick to the lower left-hand corner of the screen in order to avoid getting eaten by him. You don't really have a whole lot of mobility in the final boss battle. And the main boss's second form of two rotating spheres doesn't really make a whole lot of sense when you think about it. However, all in all, Scheherazade is one of the most ambitious games we've seen from Famicom so far. There are so many elements, time travel, the eclipse cycle, the huge number of items and spells, the lack of grinding required, or at least in the US version, the Japanese version had uh, higher thresholds for leveling up. There was a large number of playable characters, the clever way that, way that you can map spells and actions to the controller's two buttons. You know, at first I really wondered if this was actually from 1987 or if I had the wrong date. Well, it turns out that Scheherazade is simply ahead of its time. As I mentioned, there are some rather hateful moments in this game, but overall it's very well balanced and to see this appear out of nowhere in 1987 from a company like Culture Brain with a rather sketchy history is surprising to say the least. One of the very few Famicom games I've seen that sort of caught me completely off guard with its creativity and innovation. So while Scheherazade is far from perfect, it certainly gets massive points for breaking away from the usual format of all these action-based RPGs we've been seeing on the Famicom. Now I mentioned that this episode would contain a Nintendo game that you've never heard of, and here it is. Virtually unknown outside of Japan, it is Famicom Mukashi Banashi Shin Onigashima. Mukashi Banashi basically means stories of old times. The Wikipedia page for this game translates the title as Famicom Fairy Tales. Shin Onigashima means New Demon Island. And this finds Nintendo headed into unknown waters for them, since Shin Onigashima is a menu-based adventure game. It was developed by Nintendo and Pax Sofnica, with music by Koji Kondo. First of all, note how resolutely Japanese this game is. Nintendo almost seems making a statement with the design here. Not a single word is written in the Roman alphabet. Even the copyright date is in Japanese characters. All the text is read vertically and from right to left and it actually appears on these scrolls that unroll and roll up themselves. Now this all makes perfect sense, since the game is based around historic Japanese folklore, specifically the legend of Momotaro, the Peach Boy, and Takatori Monogatari. Momotaro, incidentally, was later the subject of a series of video games from Hudson. So all the uh, unity and design and concept is actually pretty impressive, though it does leave us uh, presenting with uh, one little problem often found in games of this sort, namely the tiny postage stamp size window depicting the action itself. The original uh, Japanese text adventure games uh, were a lot more on, uh, on computers, so it's not surprising that we end up with a screen layout that looks kind of like it was originally designed for a computer game. Now of course, uh, Shin Onigashima is notable as the first menu-based adventure game from Nintendo, which shows just how popular this genre is becoming. It's also an example of Nintendo branching out into a genre that was pretty much established by the time they got around to doing their own take on it. It was really not very common for Nintendo to do this. I mean, if you think about it, 
Other than their generic sports titles, Nintendo had mostly stuck with platformers and action-adventure games. That is, genres that they themselves helped popularize, for example, games based on Mario and Zelda. We haven't really seen them work much outside this comfort zone. They've really done no shoot-em-ups, beat-em-ups, RPGs, war strategy games, puzzle games. Really no games like that for the Famicom. With Shin Onigashima, Nintendo was basically jumping on the Portopia train. Of course, Nintendo was not really content to make simply another murder mystery adventure game. They decided to put their own take on it uh, by giving it this Japanese folklore setting. So what's going on here? Well, you know your standard adventure item game menus first of all. Your main menu is on the bottom. Most of the time the commands listed from right to left are look, take, talk, move, and inventory. Now this part here is just the prologue. Uh, the woodcutter character will eventually find the two infants that become the game's main characters, one in a rice bowl and then one in a bamboo tree. One of the first little obstacles here is I'm trapped by this bear in the woods and require the help of this odd little fellow to get past him. Now once the main game starts and you take control of the two main characters, you can switch back and forth between them at will. The little box right below the image will show you which character is equipped, though of course there's nothing there now. Nintendo had a very unusual release plan for this game. It's two discs, but was released separately. One at the beginning, and then one at the end of September. Note that Shin Onigashima 2 is not a sequel, it is literally the second disc of the game. You will need to reach a certain point on disc 1, and then actually swap out the disc mid-game. You can't put in disc 2 and just start playing. The game was apparently pretty successful, and versions for the Super Famicom and Game Boy Advance were later released. It's also on the Japanese Virtual Console. I guess it started a series of menu-based adventure games from Nintendo that remained mostly unseen in the West. This is actually too bad, because I mean, you know, this is actually a pretty major release from Nintendo, and one that will probably never be translated into English. And of course, you can give, you can give it a try to play it, but it's going to require pretty heavy-duty Japanese skills, as far as I can tell, so folks who have only sort of a basic command of video game Japanese will probably not have much luck with this. And going back to toy companies, one of Takara's main rivals was Tomy, who focused more on younger children's toys. I say they were rivals because they merged a few years ago. At this point, Tomy wasn't releasing Famicom games themselves, thus Zoids was published by Toshiba EMI. Now, for those of you who don't recall, Zoids were a line of mech toys, first released in the 1980s. These mechs were all shaped like dinosaurs or animals, and of course there were spin-off comics and anime, and the story had something to do with, you know, two warring empires, blah blah blah. So that's you there, that's your little robot character. Presumably a spin-off video game will be an action platformer where you battle evil zoids and... Wait a minute. This game is a Dragon Quest clone? That doesn't even make any sense. I mean, first of all, I thought the Zoids were supposed to be like these giant robots piloted by little guys sitting inside the heads, but here they're like they're human-sized. No, wait a second, I was wrong. Dragon Quest had two guards in the throne room, not one, so this is really nothing like Dragon Quest. And actually, no, these don't even really look like robots. They look, well, I don't know what they look like exactly. But um, I will admit I know nothing whatsoever about the Zoids universe, but this does seem pretty ridiculous. I mean, why would all these mechs be hanging out inside of a castle? Well, once you're outside, this game still looks an awful lot like Dragon Quest, but there are some differences. For example, Zoids is not a turn-based RPG. Oh sure, you wander around on the overworld, um, but it actually more resembles an action RPG at this point, because the enemies are clearly visible on the map. Remember, at this time in Japan, action RPGs were actually a lot more common than these random battle turn-based Dragon Quest style of uh, RPGs. However, when you run into an enemy, you switch to a vaguely Dragon Quest-like first-person view. You can check out the enemy stats and your stats. And of course, like any RPG of this era, you will almost immediately encounter enemies way too powerful for you. And here's the weird thing, these battles are done like Battlezone style. 
you turn left and right and then fire shots off at the other Zoids. So this game managed to somehow rip off both Dragon Quest and Battle Zone, which is a pretty unusual combination when you think about it. Okay, here I'm taking on enemies that are a little more at my level. Well, while Zoids barely even qualifies as an RPG, it still has the honor of being one of the very first games that tries to look like Dragon Quest, even though it doesn't really play like that. Now, as I'm sure you weren't wondering, yes, this was ported to computers, such as the MSX2. And you know how the MSX isn't very good at scrolling? Well, lord, take a look at this. This will give you a seizure if you watch it for too long. The two versions do seem to look very similar, almost identical, uh, scrolling issues aside. Okay, back to the lovely looking Famicom version. So who is responsible for this? Well, uh, Micronix, it appears. I suppose this is not bad looking for a Micronix game. It does look, you know, kind of idiotic, but Micronix have definitely put out uglier games. How does it work as an overall game? Well, it's really hard to say, but uh, at least it's not your typical crappy platformer. We've certainly seen enough of those so far. Fantastic news, folks. You all remember uh, Koto no Ken for the Famicom, of course. Well, the folks who brought you that game are back for more. Yep, publisher Toei and Kasoga Masters Bears have teamed up to give you SWAT, a trivial little piece of junk based on the manga from the rather obscure artist Oki Hijima. I think there was also a movie based on this as well. In SWAT, as far as I can tell, you control a four-man SWAT team. Your objective is to infiltrate the office building and kill terrorists. Uh, presumably there are some other plot points as well, but when I was playing, I pretty much just encountered a lot of firefights with terrorists. You act these out Dragon Quest style, only much longer. You select actions for all your team members, then everyone lines up and takes shots. You have weapons such as knives, SMGs, hand grenades, rifles, and the WIR, which I guess is a wire used to garrote someone? That's pretty brutal. Unlike Dragon Quest, these battles are way too long, and there's no sort of animation or anything of visual interest really occurring at all other than some text being displayed. You can simply wound your enemies in order to get to talk to them afterwards, or um, if you keep shooting, you can simply kill them. Now, if this somehow sounds cool and interesting and different, well, yeah, I, I guess it would be if the game wasn't so terrible. Oh, I just shot someone right there. He's only wounded so far. But uh, because I'd actually think taken a few more shots at him, I've actually killed him entirely. I mean, one thing about this is the uh, the encounter rate is really absurd. I mean, I ran into like three groups of enemies before taking even like one step. And look how screwed up the backgrounds are when you're walking around. Uh, many of the names in the credits for Hokuto Ken turn up in SWAT as well. So it's really no surprise this is terrible. And I guess the idea of a slightly tactical squad-based SWAT game is pretty unique to the system so far, but the execution just simply kills the whole thing. Just like other Bears games, this gets like, you know, really low marks for visual presentation. I mean, seriously, will you actually want to work in an office building with walls that color? If Zoids and SWAT demonstrated the wrong way to do an RPG, then let's take a look at something a bit more credible, Digital Devil Saga, Megami Tensei. Yes, that's right, this is the first Megami Tensei game. The series is actually that old. There have been many games in this series, including the now very popular Persona games, but this makes Megami Tensei one of the longest running console RPG series, along with Dragon Warrior. The game is based on a novel by one Aya Nishitani. It concerns a brilliant high school student who writes a computer program that can summon demons. This unleashes the god Loki, who causes all sorts of trouble. Ridiculous, you say? Well, remember that back in the 1980s, home computers were still pretty new. People really put a lot of faith in the capabilities of these things. After all, according to contemporary pop culture, it was conceivable that you could use one to start a nuclear war? Or maybe create an artificial human being out of nothing? 
Or maybe that computers would require human blood to perform various evil acts. So summoning demons on a computer wasn't really outside the realm of possibility. You start by choosing your character's attributes. You have sort of like uh, attribute points to assign. And then go into the dungeon and put a stop to the demon's evil plans. The main bad guys here seem to be Loki, Lucifer, and Seth. A lot of the gods and demons and spells in this game return in many of the later games. Megami Tensei is a first-person dungeon crawler, but one that gives you a lot of freedom for a Japanese RPG of this vintage. It's actually rather groundbreaking in some ways. The game was developed by Atlas, it seems, and is the first of two Atlas games this episode. The man who apparently created the series is one Koji Okada. He worked on the series for years before leaving Atlas in 2003. There are no enemies on the first level, so you walk around, talk to NPCs, find some money, buy some items. That's what I'm doing there, by the way. Then head out to kick some ass. So here's your basic slime. You have your standard options, fight, and run, and uh, so on, and uh... Oh. Excuse me? I'm getting killed? The first monster I encounter killed me in, like, two turns? Uh, yeah, this game does seem to have a, uh, how shall we say, rather steep difficulty curve. The strategy early on seems to be go up one floor, fight a monster, then run back to the first level, get healed up, and then repeat. Luckily, you level up pretty fast, but this game really throws no punches. One nice thing is you are able to usually successfully run away from enemies. Actually quite helpful after you've been, uh, well, I guess I've actually died again here. I really hate that Minotaur guy. Now there is actually one new option here, uh, the auto-fight option. Hitting that will put the game on, uh, the game battle on autopilot, which is pretty useful when you're sort of reasonably powered up and you're just sort of going through uh, levels and taking on normal enemies. But the big, big novelty of the Megami Tensei games is that you can get demons to join you as allies. Rather than fighting, you can talk to them, and sometimes they might join your party for a price. You can then breed demons together to create more powerful demons, since they don't level up like you do. The entire series is actually sort of built around this demon breeding concept. I've gotten myself pretty banged up here, we we'll need to head back to the main floor to get the other party member revived. Incidentally, your other party member is Yumiko, who just happens to be a reincarnation of the Shinto goddess Izanami. Megami Tensei means Goddess Reincarnation. Oddly, in the latest game in the series, Persona 4, and oh yeah, here is a spoiler alert, in Persona 4, the final bad guy turns out to be Izanami, so the series has sort of come full circle. If you're at all familiar with the story of Izanami, you'll know she's a goddess with a whole lot of problems, to say the least. One very cool thing about this game is that while many role-playing games used your typical, you know, giant centipedes and dragons and ogres and whatnot, Many of the characters are based off of figures from world mythology, various demons and gods and goddesses and whatnot. And while this game has fallen a bit into obscurity, there is an even more obscure Megami Tensei game that came out right around the same time, actually a little bit before this game. The Famicom game was published by Namco, but uh, Nihon Telenet of Valve's fame released this game for the MSX and PC-88 computers. Developed by Wolf Team, it uses the same basic concept but is a much simpler top-down action RPG type game. This is very similar to the situation with Valis. I can only assume uh, Telenet wasn't interested in releasing Famicom games, so they were licensing the rights to their properties to other publishers. Whatever the story was, it ended up being the Namco game, not this one, that took off and launched a thousand sequels and spin-offs. There doesn't really seem to be anything wrong with the Telenet game, it just sort of falls in the shadow of the Atlas-developed game. So anyway, while Megami Tensei is basically a dungeon crawler, there are a lot of factors that set it apart from similar games like the uh, Deep Dungeon series. Aside from having vastly superior graphics and enemy design, and you know the pseudo 3D environments are actually somewhat convincing, there's also a bit more variety in the dungeons. Most surprisingly, some parts actually take place outside. You move down city streets with rows of buildings replacing uh, the dungeon walls. This is not something I've actually seen, in first-person dungeon crawlers prior to this. There are also way more spells than in your other Japanese RPGs of this time, including sort of elemental aligned attack spells, various status spells, I get put to sleep here as you can see, a spell to show you the map, uh, even enemies have good or evil alignments. 
Unfortunately, most of the Megami Tensei games were not released outside of Japan until relatively recently, and this game has never been available in English. An English translation is apparently forthcoming, an unofficial translation that is, and once that happens I'd like the game get a bit more attention in the West. As far as I can tell, this game suffers from a lot of the same problems as other Japanese RPGs, lots of grinding required, uh, really not much in terms of character development or plot or anything like that. But if you compare this to other RPGs released in the Famicom in 1987, it really is very impressive. Tecmo has a bit of a reputation for its sports titles in the U.S., mostly due to Tecmo Bowl. However, here's one you probably haven't seen, Supari Ozumo. Ozumo is the sport that we call professional sumo wrestling. Now, in Japan, sumo is a very serious sport, almost a sacred sport in some ways. It has connections to Shinto, and there are aspects regarding the purity of the sport that might puzzle the non-Japanese. For example, females are not allowed to enter a sumo ring, and a handful of salt is thrown into ring before the bout in order to purify it. Supari means roughly thrust, and is a basic sumo move, as seen on the game box cover art. Supari Ozmo is sort of like a typical wrestling game title, in that you face a series of opponents in order to climb the sumo ranks. However, you only have two basic attacks. You can shove your opponent backwards, or grab him by the thong. The other sumo will do the same to you, and you'll need to counter his attacks. You generally win a round by pushing him out of the ring, or by getting his stamina down to zero, which will often trigger some sort of instant win move. Each sumo has a stamina meter down there at the bottom, you can kind of see the meter sort of constantly moving up and down, and I don't really fully understand how this meter works. Um, a successful attack will decrease the stamina of the attackee, that's the left portion on the bar, but the bar also seems to increase in length and starts flashing at times. Unfortunately, I don't really fully understand the mechanics of the game. Now this is notable for being the first console sumo game, actually one of the first sumo games period. There was an arcade game from Technos a few years prior. While sumo games would never be as common as, say, Mahjong games, it is a significant Japanese game genre, distinct from the traditional American wrestling game. Supari Uzumu did end up getting a sequel on the Super Famicom a few years later. Is it any good? Well, I guess it's okay. The moveset, like I mentioned, seems very limited. Basically, you can push, sort of grab and try to lift up, and you can actually uh, swing him around. This is useful if you're getting near the edge of the ring. Though at times the game does feel sort of like a button mashing fest. The game does have a sense of humor. Some of the finishing moves are actually quite humorous looking. I suppose fans of wrestling games might want to check this out just to sort of see something a little different. As a little special feature of this episode, I thought I'd take a closer look at some of the non-Nintendo video games in the year 1987. We've already been examining the Sega Master System in our sister series, Cron Sega, but one major source of video game entertainment in 1987 was the home computer. There isn't going to be any sort of Cron computer series, so I thought maybe we'd take a quick look at the world of computer games in 1987. By the early 1980s, home computers were becoming very affordable and immensely popular. The rise of the computer figured quite heavily into the video game crash of 1983-1984. By 1987, the major players were as follows. The grand old men of the home computer scene, the Apple II, originally introduced in 1977, and the Commodore 64 from 1982. The newcomers on the scene were the rather expensive Apple Macintosh, released to great fanfare in 1984, the Atari ST, and the Commodore Amiga both of which featured what might be called next-gen graphics. These were both released in 1985. The IBM PC, or PC clone, saw a new graphical standard, EGA, in 1984, and introduced the cutting-edge VGA standard in 1987. And overseas, there were the machines that were popular regionally, such as the Spectrums, MSXs, PC-88s, 98s, Sharps, and so on. <laughs> 
Let's start off with one of the oldest computer game genres, the adventure game. Enormously popular in the early 1980s, text adventure games were still a viable niche genre in 1987. Infocom, the company behind the blockbuster Zork, was still putting these things out. For example, The Lurking Horror, a Lovecraft-themed text adventure game. These games were, you know, all text, no graphics. All input had to be typed in, in a fashion so that the text parser could actually understand what you were trying to say. Gameplay tended to revolve around exploration, item collecting, and puzzle solving. Beyond Zork was a fairly late entry in Infocom's flagship series. Some basic graphic elements were added into the game. But either way, the text adventure, or interactive fiction genre, as it was eventually called, was already pretty retro by 1987. A more modern variation on the series was the graphical adventure game. 1987 sees the debut of the Leisure Suit Larry franchise from Sierra. Sierra pretty much invented the genre in 1984 with its game King's Quest. At this time, Sierra was the big name in computer adventure games, and Larry was an attempt to produce an adult-oriented adventure game with like a humorous edge. While this was very tame by today's standards, it was reasonably edgy in 1987. Sierra's games allowed you to move your character around with a joystick, though you still had to input commands or speech via the keyboard. Nowadays, of course, these games seem a little unfair, full of, you know, unexpected deaths and illogical puzzles. That was kind of the in-house Sierra style. For example, hmm, flush the toilet? Well, you better not do that. But overall, the Larry games, they were pretty fun and uh, pretty reasonable for adventure games of this era. Police Quest was another Sierra series that debuted in 1987, and this was a relatively accurate police procedural game in which you must, well, you sort of do a lot of boring police stuff, actually. Again, uh, there are tons of ways to get game overs. Forget to inspect your vehicle before drop it driving off? Well, there's a game over. Late for your briefing? Game over. Most Sierra games had sort of some kind of frustrating action-adventure sequences, and Police Quest was no exception. Like, for example, when you have to drive your car around. Uh, if you hit anything at all, well, then it's game over. Luckily, these games allowed you to save anytime you wanted to. Now, even though the graphical adventure genre was only three years old, a new generation of games was already emerging. For example, ICOM Simulations, Mac Venture Games for the Macintosh, this series began in 1985 with Deja Vu, which was a detective game. Instead of typing in your text, you interact using a point-and-click interface with the mouse and a number of menu options, actually very similar to the Japanese adventure games we were seeing on the Famicom. 1987 saw the most well-known Mac Venture game, Shadowgate, which also had an Amiga release with a substantial graphics update. This is what we're looking at here. While the interface was streamlined, Shadowgate still had the same issues as Sierra's games, namely constant death. You can die in the first room if you don't light a second torch quick enough. Of course, you stumble around the dark and break your neck. Not very heroic. Lots of picking up items and figuring out how to use them. The game was pretty successful and there was an NES port um, that still remembers today. Though, of course, they might not be happy memories. For example here, you can clearly see there's a ladder leading down. Why did you fall and die? However, the way forward in adventure games came in the form of Maniac Mansion from LucasArts. This was the first game from their new Scum engine, and features a uh, very easy to use interface. With Maniac Mansion, LucasArts kind of set adventure games in a new direction, one that didn't involve constant deaths and game-ending dead ends. Many folks consider the games that followed Maniac Mansion from LucasArts to be sort of the pinnacle of the adventure genre. As for Maniac Mansion, it received a well-known Nintendo port a few years later, and was definitely one of the major highlights of 1987. Another really ancient computer game genre was that of the war game, as seen here with Panzer Strike, a DOS game. Just like RPGs, war games were based on board games and had a rather cultish following. SSI was one of the big publishers of war games back in the day, and in 1987 they were still cranking them out. These games are all about strategy, stats, and historical accuracy, rather than stylish graphics, obviously. You generally take one side in a historic battle and move your units around on these giant maps trying to overcome the other army. Related to war games were the military simulation games. Flight simulations were actually pretty popular, and I guess, well, they're still around today, of course. 
One quality title was Microprose's Project Stealth Fighter for the Commodore 64. These are not casual games, they were aimed at military aircraft aficionados. Project Stealth Fighter gives you a wide variety of options for planes and weapons and missions. However, these games use a very complicated control scheme. You really have to know how to actually operate the jet's equipment, so you can't simply pick up and play. Now many gameplay ideas from war games would wind up in what we now call the strategy game. These tend to involve other elements beyond battlefield encounters, such as managing resources, technology, exploration, etc. The genre wasn't really fully formed in 1987, but an early example was this, Anacreon Reconstruction 4021, from the obscure Thinking the Scenes Association. There was exploration of space, building armies, communicating with other empires, researching new technologies, and these are all done through a rather clunky text interface. You need to type in the coordinates of planets to identify them, for example. No pointing and clicking here. Eventually, later games like Civilization, Dune 2, and so on would popularize the genre, though of course these games were usually a little bit easier to play. Now another huge hit of 1987 was Pirates for the Commodore 64. This Sid Meier game was different than anything else at the time. It was almost completely open-ended, an early sandbox game I suppose. There was a lot of sailing around, looking for gold, and sword fighting involved, but it was really up to the player how the game was to be played. Pirates could be played over and over again and never be the same. It was ported to pretty much every system under the sun, often under the name Sid Meier's Pirates, and eventually including the Nintendo Entertainment System. Now, more typical was Type Han from Ocean Software, seen here in its rather ugly form for the Commodore 64, based on the James Clavell novel. This was actually the second game based on the novel. Presumably this was released to cash in on the Type Han movie that came out. I guess this was sort of an adventure-y, uh, drug smuggling simulation type game. Not very playable or enjoyable by today's standards. Now one strategy game that was immensely successful was Defender of the Crown. This game actually came out in 1986, but its impact was still being felt the next year in 87. While much simpler than Anacreon, it was one of the first games to demonstrate the awesome graphical capabilities of the Commodore Amiga. No one had really seen anything quite like this on home computers before. 1987 saw developers exploring what could be done with the Amiga, as we'll see shortly. The object here is basically to take over the Empire, quite similar to Nobunaga's Revenge, which came out for the Famicom a little bit later. Now let's take a look at this odd little game, Colony. As a rule, computer games tended to focus more on puzzle solving and strategy than console games. Even action games tended to require you to do a bit more than move forward and jump over things. Here, for example, you need to protect your outposts from hordes of insects. This involves repairing fences, growing mushrooms, stocking up on supplies, and so on. Sort of a colony management sim. This was published by the British computer giant Master Sonic. They were responsible for marketing and distributing the Sega Master System in Europe. Eventually, some staff members uh, from Master Sonic formed the core of Virgin Interactive. Not a bad little game and one that's sort of forgotten nowadays, but was quite popular at the time. Another excellent Commodore 64 puzzle type game was Tower Toppler from another British company, Hewson. This game takes you on this uh, cylindrical tower, and there's actually a very clever feature is that the tower turns as your character moves. It's pretty impressive for a game on the older Commodore 64 system. To this day, clones of Tower Toppler continue to be released. Now far less attractive is the DOS game Kingdom of Craws. This is the first in a series of maze-based puzzle games in the Craws series. The notable thing about Cross is that they, this was actually the first game from Apogee Software. A few years down the road they would publish Wolfenstein 3D and Duke Nukem, thus uh, sort of kicking off the first person shooter genre, and they would change their name of course to 3D Realms. Tons of these sorts of games existed at the time. Um, Zor, for example. I suppose this is sort of the equivalent to Famicom games like HAL Laboratory's Eggerland. One very odd little puzzle game was Fool's Errand, a Macintosh game from Cliff Johnson. This quirky independent game um, and its follow-up, 3 and 3, received critical accolades and it developed quite a cult following over the years. The game involves solving a series of interconnected puzzles, which unlock chapters in the game's storybook. It's uh, sometimes kind of a baffling game. 
This just shows the potential for creative and unique games on home computers. And of course, there were also your more standard action games on computers as well. Aside from the many arcade ports, uh, there were innumerable so-called arcade-style games that were produced. Among the more notable, The Last Ninja for the Commodore 64 from the British studio System 3. This game remains an old-school favorite and was ported to every computer system under the sun and had a few sequels. As with many computer action games, it suffers from rather stiff and unpleasant controls, so don't exactly expect Ninja Gaiden here if you try to play it nowadays. We've already seen this one, Thexter. Uh, this is the DOS version. Originally for the Japanese computers, it was ported to the Famicom by Square, and then brought to the US by Sierra. It turned out to be a big hit, one of Sierra's biggest hits, and set a new standard for cool-looking action games on computers. Dexter was probably around the closest thing to a console game to be available on computers at this time. Now, ripping off arcade games was also quite common. Take Demon Stalkers, for example. This is a game for the Commodore 64 very much in the style of Gauntlet, developed by the Australian company Microfort, and, or maybe that's Microforte, and published by Electronic Arts. Airborne Rangers, from Sid Meier's company Microprose, takes the gameplay style of Commando and adds, well, uh, lots of stuff. All kinds of weapons, different missions. Microprose was a huge publisher in the late 80s and mid-90s, with such hits as Pirates, Civilization, Railroad Tycoon, Master of Orion, and so on. Unfortunately, it was eventually swallowed up by the video game giant Infograms. Now, one game that wowed gamers with its very stylish graphics was Barbarian for the Atari ST and the Amiga. The publisher was Cygnosis, or is that Cygnosis? Not really sure. A British publisher noted for its uh, nice graphics and artwork. Several games feature the art of Roger Dean, including this one. You might remember he was the guy who did like those Yes record albums back in the 70s. While Barbarian looks great, it should be pointed out that your character moves absurdly slowly, and the game has a rather unwieldy control scheme. You have to like hit all the buttons there along the bottom in order to actually get the guy to do things. One nice thing about the Nintendo and the Famicom was that the rather simple controller meant that developers kind of had to keep the controls simple and usable. Now, of course, sports games were another big genre, and one very successful sports publisher was Epix. Uh, we've already seen them, uh, Winter Games, that really horrible port of which we saw in the Famicom a few episodes ago. Here's their latest, California Games. The Epic Sports series all feature a number of different competitive events. The primary challenge is actually trying to master the sometimes rather baroque and absurd control schemes. Epix was huge at the time, but their fortunes very quickly took a turn for the worse and they disappeared from the scene. Kind of similar was uh, Skate or Die, the first internally developed electronic arts game. EA was highly regarded in the mid-1980s for their innovative games. Eventually they focused more on mainstream style console games, and today of course they're an industry giant. Skate or Die, in which has you uh, competing in a series of uh, various skating events, was very successful and did receive a Famicom port a little bit down the road. Baseball games were always popular on both consoles and computers. Earl Weaver's Baseball, from Electronic Arts again, for the Amiga, was an example of the high level of realism found in some computer sports games. You had tons of options and choices to make, and the game had a pretty serious baseball pedigree, unlike something like, you know, Bases Loaded for the Famicom. Not only were the programmers veterans of baseball games, going back to the Intellivision days, but the legendary Orioles manager, Earl Weaver, was actually involved in the game to a substantial degree. Unlike a lot of, you know, sports games where they have some uh, major player's uh, name in the title. Test Drive was the first in a series of popular driving games from Accolade. That, of course, was an Atari or Activision spin-off company. Just like Earl Weaver's baseball, the emphasis is on realism. The cars you drive are all actual exotic sports cars and there is much more detail uh, given to the cars, such as like the various gauges and controls and so on and so forth, than in a game like Rad Racer. Computer driving games often cross the line from like racing games to sort of driving simulation games. Now, while video games in 1987 were still primarily 2D or, you know, simulated 3D, 
A few games were pushing the envelope towards genuine 3D graphics. Driller from Incentive Software used Freescape, which is actually considered to be the first full polygon-based 3D game engine. This is the Commodore 64 version, though better looking versions came out a little bit later for DOS, the Atari ST, and the Amiga. Often under the name Spaceship Oblivion, um, while it's really not much to look at today, this was thrilling and pretty amazing back in 1987. Another early British developed 3D game was Virus, seen here in its DOS version. Originally a game created for the cutting edge and rather unsuccessful Acorn Archimedes computer. Virus was a simple shooter, but was rather pioneering in its use of shading and particle effects. Nowadays it's not very fun to play, but it does hint at the direction computer games would be going in the near future. Coming full circle to one of the very oldest computer game genres, we have Wizardry 4, Return of Wordna, originally for the Apple II. Wizardry was, along with Ultima, the longest-running established RPG franchise, so a new Wizardry game was a pretty big deal. However, the series was really showing its age in 1987, it tried to make up for the old-fashioned graphics with a unique plot idea. You play as the bad guy, the wizard defeated in the first game. You summon monsters to help you fight. Unfortunately, the game throws some things at you that would really no longer be considered acceptable. For example, in the very beginning, you were trapped in a chamber, and the only way to escape is to summon a particular minion, walk around in a circle until you encounter a random battle, and hope that that minion casts a particular spell that opens hidden doors. You actually have no direct control over the minions, so you just have to do with this until he actually just happens to cast that spell. The game dispenses with many of the RPG sort of standard elements, like experience points, so while it is innovative in some ways, it's actually very dated in others. Origin Systems put out other games besides just the uh, ultimate releases, and 2400 AD is one such game. Again, we have this on the Apple II, while most RPGs had fantasy settings, a few had science fiction settings. Here you need to free mankind from its oppressive robot overlords. Much like Ultima, you walk around on an overworld and you do a lot of interaction with NPCs. It's basically an action RPG, and in a lot of ways it's kind of closer to the Japanese RPGs uh, than games like Wizardry. Now SSI, they made RPGs as well as war games. The third title in their fantasy series was released on various platforms in 1987. This is the very good-looking Amiga version. A standard Western RPG from what would be considered to be sort of like the golden age of computer RPGs. The late 80s through early 90s. While certainly not a bad game, Fantasy 3 would be sort of overshadowed by SSI's Gold Box series, starting with the wildly successful Pull of Radiance, which came out in 1988. And finally, the big RPG game of 1987 was definitely Dungeon Master from FTL Games. Like many other RPGs of the era, this is a dungeon crawler, but Dungeon Master introduces real-time battles into the first-person RPG genre. It also uses a point-and-click system as opposed to keyboard entries. You can move items around in your inventory and even equip them by dragging and dropping. Real-time combat and mouse-based controls would eventually be go on to become like the standard in Western RPGs. Though Dungeon Master was pretty much the game that did it first. Uh, definitely still a quality title and one that I suppose is recommended if you're going to be playing any of the RPGs featured in this episode. Well, that wraps up our look at computer games of 1987. Obviously, this is only a tiny fraction of the many, many, many games released for computers this year, but I think we've seen many of the highlights, or representative titles, or games of historical importance. I'd consider the big four games of 87 to be Pirates, Maniac Mansion, Dungeon Master, and I suppose Laser Shoot Larry. Well, at any rate, let's go ahead and turn back to the Famicom. Here's one big surprise this episode, Spelunker 2, Yusha e no Chosen, a rather generic sounding subtitle that means something like Challenge of the Hero, 
Now I say surprising because I would assume this would resemble Irem's sequel to Load Runner, another Broderburn connected game, you know, being that it's just a series of variations on the original game. Um, first of all, do you remember the original Spelunker? This was a classic US computer game designed by Tim Martin, originally released in 1983. The little explorer roams around the cave looking for treasure. It was infamously ported to the Famicom, courtesy of Irem in 1985, and that version is actually uh, not very well loved. However, Spelunker 2 is completely different. In fact, you would never connect it to the original game if you didn't know the title. Right from the get-go, you start with a character selection screen. Yes, Spelunker 2 has character classes, each with different stats and abilities. I'm going for the standard explorer class here. At this point in the Famicom's life, even the most basic platforming games like Spelunker were getting an RPG makeover. Even though we haven't seen too many genuine RPGs on the Famicom, every single game seems to be sprinkling in RPG elements. So you're armed with your basic explorer sword, good for up-close attacks, but you also have a limited ammo pistol. This will comes in handy and put enemies you don't want to get too close to, like that gigantic Venus flytrap or whatever. The world layout kind of reminds me a little bit of last episode's Valis. You have these horizontal paths intersected by uh, vertical exits that are moving north or south onto another parallel path. I can only assume this particular world layout was inspired by Konami's Ganbera Goemon game, which was the first Famicom game to use something like it. Um, it also has the three-quarters viewpoint of Goemon. Now other than your life bar, you have that bar called Toku. What does it do? Toku is usually translated as virtue. Now watch what happens when I uh, shoot the deer here. You might wonder how virtuous is visiting some pre-industrialized country, stealing any treasure you find, and killing all the local wildlife? Well, according to this game, pretty virtuous. Now because I've actually lost all my virtue, when I fall down one of those pits, I actually go straight down into hell. If your toku is too low, then it's game over. I guess you're condemned eternally. However, higher toku will allow you to escape. Here, by the way, I have the Esper character. In this case, I was able to be resurrected and end up back on the surface. So, certain animals are bad, killing those will raise your toku. Other animals, like the deer, are good, killing them will lower it. But killing the deer does actually replenish your health. Now, so far this looks more like Pitfall than Spelunker. Uh, but yes, there is some actual exploring caves in the game, like we see here. You will encounter various stairways leading down into the underground caverns, generally with tougher enemies, like uh, ghosts and zombies, for example. These caves are where you find keys, treasures, items, etc. However, um, they can be tough because the supernatural enemies cannot be killed by gun or knife. Which doesn't really make much sense. I mean, ghosts, yeah, I can understand, but zombies? Of course you can kill zombies with guns. Everyone knows that. Imagine trying to play Resident Evil if all the zombies were somehow bulletproof. You will eventually find a crucifix that will allow you to dispatch the undead, but you need to have your uh, high enough toku to actually use it. I did find the crucifix, but my toku is too low. I need to kill more bad enemies to raise it. Now I mentioned um, this game actually had character classes. Other than the explorer, the other ones are a wizard and an esper. Now honestly, what the wizard would do romping around in the Amazonian jungles is anyone's guess. The wizard and Esper use magical and psychic powers, respectively. For example, the Esper shoots a lightning bolt, rather than a gun. Here I'll take the Esper out for a test drive. I wonder if this was originally even intended as a Spelunker game. The developer seems to be a company called Now Production, the same guys who ported Metro Cross for Namco. It suffers from small, unattractive character sprites and uh, somewhat less than ideal controls, but I guess it comes across as a reasonably playable action-adventure game with a certain amount of exploration and item collecting. Certainly a huge improvement over the uh, port of Splunker, but this is really a sequel in name only. As promised, here's the second Atlas developed game, this time published by Jellico, 
the somewhat absurdly named Bio Senshi Dan in Greaser Tono Tadakai. That means something along the lines of Bio Warrior Dan in Greaser Tono Battle. The Terminator-like plot detailed here explains that Earth has been invaded by aliens in the year 2081, so our hero, Dan, is traveling back in time to stop the aliens before they hatch their plans. Thankfully, unlike in Terminator, his clothes travel with him. The game is, like every other Famicom game released about this time, an action game with some RPG elements. This was never released outside of Japan. However, it was localized and prepared for release in the US, and then cancelled. This version did leak out a few years ago, and we'll be taking a look at it here. Notice the plot is completely dropped here. Jellico renamed it Bashi Bazook Morphoid Masher, whatever that is supposed to mean. Pretty cool music though. So right away, this game more or less stands out for its excellent presentation. The developer Atlas did a great job of the graphics on the game, and the music is also very good. What is not so commendable is the actual gameplay. Right away you run into trouble with some rather hard to hit enemies. Still, there is really fantastic work on the NPCs. If you compare the NPC designs from games like Chesterfield, you'll see just how distinctive each and every character is and they're all fully animated as well. Take a look at this guy comparing him to, like, say, the uh, helpful old men in Zelda. And the same is also true of the, uh, the visual aspect of the levels. While the level design is not going to knock anyone off their feet, it's just the uh, same old uh, platforms and elevators that you see in so many space-themed games. They do look nice, with lots of cool colors and textures. And a, uh, a few mini-games appear here. For example, you need to wrestle this female alien to win some cash. You meet her a few times throughout the game, and she does get progressively tougher. Money actually does play a pretty important role in this game, so it is recommended that you fight her if you can. The game is just a simple button-mashing session. But still, I don't think I've seen anything quite like it in any of the other games in this genre yet. Even the ends are a little bit different. Aside from the uh, rather sort of out-of-place looking female innkeeper here, you get this little cutscene of you relaxing at the inn. However, what's with that music? It reminds me very much of the odd little uh, boogie theme from this game. Undoubtedly, that's just a coincidence. Now, I mentioned the gameplay is a little problematic at times. There are some rather frustrating moments in the level design. You often access new areas through these odd and inappropriate looking windows, but you often land right on an enemy when you come out the other side. Also, you can't jump over the enemy because you'll jump out the window again. It's uh, very difficult to avoid getting a few cheap hits, and this exact same problem occurs multiple times. The basic layout is that there are several levels, each slightly non-linear, and each containing a boss at the end. Boss battles are not fantastic, but there is one unique facet. Do you see that QB number in the upper right? That's the boss's health. Oh, by the way, in between levels you get these weird Pac-Man-like interludes where you transform into some other character. It's rather weird. Anyway, the boss's health actually slowly increases as you progress throughout the level. So the quicker you get to the boss, the easier the boss will be. Now, money plays a pretty big factor in Biodan. Enemies are always dropping it and you need it to buy weapons from the various NPCs found here and there. You start with your basic knife, but you can rather quickly get upgraded. And when you come to this guy up ahead, he'll actually sell you a quote-unquote laser disc. It's a rather cool weapon, um, but most of the better weapons cost money to use. And yeah, that's right, using the laser disc will cost you $4 every time you throw it. This boss battle can be a little bit tricky due to the wonky jumping controls. You have to move forward a little bit right before you jump, and I often got stuck while trying to clear that little platform in the middle. If you die fighting a boss, you'll need to use the exit to transport you back to early level. It's a little cruel. So this is a very nice attempt from Atlas, and while it's far from perfect, you can tell a lot of effort went into Biosenshi Dan, giving it sort of a, a sheen of quality missing from most of the typical games in this genre.
Okay, so there's good news and there's bad news. Which do you want first? The good news? Okay. We have a Capcom game. Hooray! But the bad news? Well, this is actually a Mahjong game. Yep, it's Ide Yosuka Meijin, Jisun Mahjong. Jisun Mahjong means something like Battle Mahjong. Now who is this Ide Yosuke guy? Well, he's a Mahjong player who lent his name to a whole series of Mahjong games. I guess he's sort of like the Mahjong John Madden, I suppose. Now Capcom actually went all out here. Rather than the D-pad, the game is controlled by a special keyboard that comes packaged with the game. Many arcade Mahjong video games had a keyboard interface. It doesn't really make much sense to play Mahjong with a joystick. Capcom's deluxe treatment drove the price up to 6,500 yen, making this one of the most expensive titles on the Famicom so far. Hopefully the folks who coughed up for this game got their money's worth. Aside from that, this appears to be the sort of standard head-to-head -head Mahjong action here. I suppose the existence of this game will remind us that yeah, Capcom did release stuff like this for the Japanese market. It wasn't all Street Fighters and Mega Mans. Well, here's one completely out of left field. HAL suddenly goes all retro and releases a series of ports of old arcade games from Atari and Williams. First up is Stargate. In the time of larger and larger cartridges, Stargate's one of the smallest for the system. The cart's only 128 kilobits. That's right, kilobits, not kilobytes. Now obviously this is a port of Williams' 1981 arcade shooter, the sequel to Defender, originally developed by VidKids. It was also released under the name Defender 2. Stargate's considered a classic of early video games, but nowadays the control scheme seems overly difficult to use. The joystick only controls your vertical movement, a separate button fires your thrusters, and another button turns the ship around. Altogether, Stargate had six buttons, by the way. The object is to shoot aliens and rescue humans, and you're supposed to catch the humans, by the way, not shoot them. Easier said than done. I suppose six years seems like a long time in video game terms today, but in the 1980s, it was a lifetime. Compare Stargate to Salamander and just see how much shooters had changed within that five-year period. Sadly, the Famicom version isn't really arcade perfect. Uh, for example, the radar screen doesn't really show everything, and the enemies are not as detailed. I guess overall the port is decent. Now, HAL didn't release all their games in the US, but they did release this one under the name Defender 2. Now let's take a look at something here. Does the opening music sound kind of familiar? Yeah, that's right. I'm not really sure how that came about. Also, the sprites have been changed a little bit for the US version for some reason. Also strange is the name of Atari on the title screen. Now this is a Williams game, not an Atari game, but Atari Soft did port the game to some computers in the early 80s. Is this version supposedly based on that? I don't know, but it is a little odd. Alright folks, now we're starting to dwell into the truly obscure. Taito has released some weird games, the Takeshi Katano game for example, and now this, Kion Shizu 2. Plenty of folks in the West know beat Katano, but Kion Shizu 2? We're getting pretty deep in obscure Japanese pop culture here, so this might require some explanation. Kionshi is the Japanese word for Jiangshi, what we in the West call the Chinese hopping vampire. A number of Chinese films were produced in the 1980s and 90s featuring vampires. The movie that kicked off the trend was the Sammo Hung produced Mr. Vampire from 1985. Now, Mr. Vampire is one of the all time classics of Hong Kong action cinema, and if you've never seen it, well, see this movie as soon as possible. One low budget Mr. Vampire knockoff was the 1985 Taiwanese movie known as Hello Dracula in the US. There were four movies in the series, and they were shown on Japanese TV under the Kion Shizu name. Kion Shizu 2 is the second movie released in 1987. And that, of course, is what this game is based off of. While you can find an English subtitled version of Hello Dracula online, I don't think an English version to Kion Shizu 2 actually exists. So about Taito's game, well, it falls into the general category of the graphical adventure game. Most of the game takes place in this rather large Chinese city 
It really resembles Moeta Princess. That was Imagineer's obscure Famicom Disk System game. We covered it back in episode 14. So you run around the city talking to various folks, buying items, and so on. There are tons of buildings and shops in this game, and quite a few people to talk to. Use the uh, now standard Japanese adventure game menu to interact with the NPCs. Now one thing, it's not always clear which buildings can be entered and where the entrances are. A lot of times you just run up against the wall and then allow you to enter. Now what's the point of this game? Well, I'm not really sure. Certainly it has something to do with vampires. You do encounter vampires in the game. Uh, for example, you can enter the guard towers and then move along the ramparts, and you will find a vampire in here. Additionally, there are action sequences in the game. These uh, side-scrolling sections where you fight vampires and other creatures. These all seem very simply done. There are also all these uh, catacombs uh, of some sort under the city, and these can be accessed through the various manhole covers that you see kind of, you know, around the ground. Oddly, the character design uh, in these sequences reminds me a lot of Irem's Kung Fu game. So, Kion Shizu 2 seems to be sort of a complicated graphical adventure game with poorly implemented action sequences. Too bad. Even in Japan, this game seems mostly forgotten. Alright, now we're talking. Salamander. Konami sequel to Gradius. It's been a while since we've seen a good shoot 'em up on the Famicom, and this definitely fits the bill. Of course, in the US, we know this under the name Life Force. Anyone who's played Gradius will immediately recognize that Konami is referencing the opening of that game, with these first few waves of enemies here. Now, Salamander has an unusually confusing uh, release history, so let's take a look. The first version was this arcade release in Japan under the name of Salamander. Notable features are the speech samples and the new power-up system. Rather than using the Gradius system of power-ups, here enemies drop frequent random power-ups. Uh, this makes pimping out the big viper a little bit easier. You can get options, missiles, lasers, etc. within the first few waves of enemies. The most striking visual element of Salamander was the fact that the first level was designed if you were traveling inside some sort of living organism first enemy was a gigantic brain. Now, Konami must have liked that concept because they reworked the game for US arcades, altering the background to make it look like the entire game was inside of the creature's body and calling it Life Force. Then in 1987, it was altered again and re-released in arcades in Japan as Life Force, this time with new backgrounds and new sprites, and using the old Gradius power-up system. Also notable is this MSX port, released in December 1987. This version features a different plot, redesigned game, and a new and rather dramatic introduction. And oh yes, your characters have been renamed after Iggy Pop and David Bowie, of all people. Now as for the Famicom version, it's not really a port of any of these. It mostly resembles the original Salamander, but has the Gradius-style power-up system. Some levels have been removed, and other brand new levels have been added in instead. Sometimes, Salamander doesn't always play fair, like here for example, where you can get stuck behind this indestructible wall if you take the lower path. The Japanese arcade life force was pretty difficult due to the fact that it was harder to power up your ship using the Gradius style system. Each option, for example, required five power-ups. The Famicom version isn't quite as difficult, in fact once you're fully powered up, you can cut through waves of enemies like a hot knife through butter. Why? Well, two words, Ripple Laser. Ripple Laser plus three options turns the Vic Piper into a flying wall of death. Here's the first boss, the Brain Golem. The whole organic feel to this level would be exploited to great effect in the Irem game R-Type, which came out in arcades in 1987. And quite frankly, if you have the Ripple, uh, three options, and the missiles, most bosses can be beaten without even breaking a sweat. Ah, you gotta shoot this guy in the eye. One unusual thing about Salamander is that it alternates between horizontal and vertical levels, breaking from the Gradius tradition. 
Now one thing is, I, I do apologize if this video looks a little weird at times. Um, watching this in 30 frames per second means some things are not quite captured the way they should be, and sometimes the uh, action looks a little bit flickery, and sometimes you can't see all the missiles being fired. And sometimes also the force field does cause some graphical problems as well in the video. Now other than the first level, uh, the most impressive one is actually this one right here, the fire level. Truly awesome, and obviously inspired the beginning of Gradius 2. First time you see one of those gigantic arcs of flame leap up, your jaw will hit the ground, and you will probably be killed as well. Yeah, that is pretty cool. So here's a question, why is this called Salamander in Japan? What do those little amphibious creatures have anything to do with alien invasions? Well, you know, while the salamander is a real-life animal, it's also applied to a legendary creature, uh, usually depicted as some sort of lizard or dragon. The salamander was said to have an affinity to fire, though there is some confusion here. Uh, supposedly the salamander was so cold it could actually withstand fire, even put fires out. But sometimes it was thought of being sort of like a fiery or fire-breathing lizard. Um, this use of the word salamander turns up in video games from time to time. Konami presumably had this in mind, since uh, fire and lizards and fire-breathing lizards kind of feature in this game. Now here's one of the new levels, uh, Ribcage and a Skull. On a technical note, while Salamander is visually uh, very impressive to look at, you know, great colors and huge bosses and tons of projectiles, sometimes there can be a bit of slowdown when you fire weapons. Of course, sometimes this is to your advantage. Now, Salamander is not perfect by any means. Uh, the home version does feature this odd egyptian theme level, which requires you to navigate past some walls and columns and that sort of thing. It's a bit annoying, and the setting really makes no sense whatsoever. Of course, the plot is a little vague. The US manual states you're flying through the body of this gigantic world-eating alien Zelos, and the final boss is actually his heart and soul. The MSX version gives a completely different story, however. One nice feature, two-player co-op. A second player can control the absurdly named, uh, well, Lord British, I guess someone wasn't an Ultima fan, but Konami's typically lame manual for the US version calls him Road British. Uh, though slowdown, of course, would be an even bigger issue with the two ships. Now the final boss in the Great Distribution is uh, actually pretty easy, as you make your slow and dramatic approach. You'll see he's actually pretty darn impressive looking. Uh, he actually returns in the Famicom version of Gradius 2. Now hopefully you have some lives left over, since this game has a rather nasty bit of surprise at the end. But all in all, Salamander and Life Force, um, one of the best shooters for the Famicom and quite an achievement. And of course, in uh, every Konami game, it ends with the bad guy's base blowing up. As the Famicom was becoming sort of more and more geared towards original titles and platformers and action RPGs and that sort of thing, we're seeing fewer and fewer like big name arcade titles come into the system, so uh, Salamander is definitely one of the exceptions to the rule. It's those weirdos at Sunsoft again, this time with their first US-only release, a port of Bally Midway's 1983 arcade classic, Spy Hunter. The home version gets this nifty new title screen, but no one failed compelled to actually have any music for the game's intro. That is often, though not always, a sign that this was sort of a rushed release. Presumably Sunsoft wanted to get in on the rapidly opening console game market in the US, and didn't feel any of their existing titles would have been suitable. I don't know if you've noticed, but all of the Sunsoft games we've seen so far have been Japan-only releases. Now here's the original arcade version. It was a very popular game at the time, uh, but much of it had to do with the arcade cabinet. It had a very cool steering wheel controller, and each of the weapons had its own button on the steering wheel itself, so it looked kind of like the wheel you would actually expect a tricked-out spy car to have. There was also a two-speed gear shift knob. What set Spy Hunter apart from other games were your car's weapons. Entering the weapons van would be outfitted with some extra weapons like uh, the oil slick, the smoke screen, and missiles. Obviously the NES version suffers a bit graphically, uh, but still looks better than earlier ports. Spy Hunter had been released for virtually every platform in the world at this point. The 2600, ColecoVision, various computers. The 2600 release was published by Sega, of all people. This port seems sort of, oh, I don't know, so-so 
it's reasonably accurate to the original, but doesn't really seem like a fleshed out console game. The presentation isn't too impressive. The special weapons seem a little lame. Let's look at the smokescreen, for example. Just like the arcade version, it does use the Peter Gunn theme as background music, uh, but there are long, silent sections. And not much really happens in the game. You drive over land, bridges, and occasionally turn into a boat. And then there are signs that the game was actually sort of hastily ported. Uh, various glitches do appear. Probably the most notorious is the fact that at times your car can go off-road and drive through all the scenery unharmed. When this happens, uh, Spy Hunter becomes kind of like the big rigs over the road racing of its day. Unfortunately, I'd say Spy Hunter just sort of loses something in the transition from an arcade game with its specialized spy car controls to an NES game played at home on the D-pad. You just really don't feel like a Spy Hunter playing this. There we go, another 15 games down. One thing about this month, and maybe you noticed, we only had one Famicom Disk System game, and it was from Nintendo. The Disk System's glory days are already behind it. Now don't get me wrong, we'll still be seeing plenty of FDS games, but after late 1986 and the first half of 1987, the number of discs being released will be steadily diminishing, and we'll see fewer big name titles. So I hope you'll join us next time, and hopefully we'll be seeing Crontendo episode 23 in a more timely fashion.